let's go ahead and get started. So we start on time and um, make sure we respect everybody's time. If you're here um, looking for the Lean Resolution Town Hall webinar, you're in the right place. You're most likely watching from uh, either YouTube, our YouTube channel, or the Facebook group, uh, the Plaintiff for Personal Injury Attorney Only Facebook group. Um, so thanks for being here. We'll get started. We've got Dave Place, who is a national expert in lean resolution, who's going to be walking us through most of this uh, lean resolution um, webinar today. We're doing this webinar um, for members of the personal injury attorney group. Uh, when you join that group, we ask you a, a series of questions about what kinds of topics you're interested in and what you're looking to learn more about. Many of you responded that, you're, that you would love to learn more about lean resolution, ERISA liens, healthcare liens, Medicare liens. And so we're trying to be responsive to those requests. So that's what this webinar is hopefully designed to do. Um, if you have a question, during the presentation, email um, lean at amicusplanners.com. Again, that's lean at amicusplanners.com. And that those questions will pop up on my other screen over here. And then towards the end of Dave's presentation, I will ask some of those questions depending on how much time we have. And then Dave can kind of answer those questions. The other nice thing about that is that if we don't get to your specific question during the live webinar, um, we'll have your question in email format and Dave can respond, you know, or give you a call um, depending on what's easier. So with that, um, let me just introduce ourselves. My name is Greg Maxwell. So I'm with Amicus Settlement Planners. We do all types of settlement planning work. So everything from structured settlement annuities to special needs planning for your clients that are on Medicaid and SSI to attorney fee deferral solutions, um, and then also lien resolution in conjunction with, with Dave. So as you, as you come to the settlement stage of a case and you have questions about any of those topics, give us a call or a resource to help you with that. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and I'm gonna turn the time over to Dave Place and let him introduce himself a little bit in more detail and then, and then get into the presentation itself. So Dave, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Greg, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I know spending your afternoon learning about ERISA or Medicare may not be the most exciting thing. I know when Greg said everyone would love to learn about lean resolution, I'm sure it was more they need to learn about lean resolution and would love to learn about it. Um, but hopefully I'll give you some helpful tips today on how to address um, ERISA, Medicare, Medicare Advantage plans, FEBA plans, which are federal employee plans, and Medicaid. Um, a little background on who I am. I'm an attorney, um, licensed in these um, circuits and districts. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years exclusively, lean resolution. Um, before I started doing um, this work, I was a medical malpractice and product liability defense attorney. Um, so I've slowly gotten better. I went from denying coverage to uh, getting money back through subrogation now to protecting injury victims. So it's been an evolution. Um, I spent 15 years on the other side working at a company which is now known as Equion, formerly known as Trover, formerly known as Healthcare Recoveries. Um, it keeps changing names every seven years because different hedge funds um, are the ones who buy that company. Um, it's no longer traded publicly as hedge funds buy it out. Well, the first thing I talk about is ERISA. Those are most of the questions I get are about ERISA. Um, most um, health plans out there are ERISA plans. We'll talk about the various kinds of ERISA plans. And ERISA has a reputation for being a monster that's going to destroy your case. Um, I want to demystify that. Um, certainly, it's a big issue. Certainly, they have very strong rights, but it's something we can deal with. Well, the first thing you need to do when you have a client walks in and they're on an ERISA plan is to begin to build a defense against those subrogation and reimbursement claims. And the first thing you're going to want to do is use 29 USC 1024B4. It's simply a statutory document request. It'll feel like you're playing small ball. Um, it's right there for you on the slide. Um, it is a broad statute. That's the real benefit of it. It covers everything. I often say every piece of paper in the file cabinet near the plan, I want a copy of. Um, that is the real benefit of this, of this statute is the broad nature of it, as well as the penalties they'll be asserted against the plan for not complying with it. 
So let's break the statute down because this really is one of the, the um, key components you need to be sure you're doing in your practice to deal with these ERISA liens. The first and most important part of the statute is it says the administrator shall. That is key. This is the single biggest mistake I see being made for the past 20 years. This letter needs to be sent to the plan administrator. That is not Rawlings or Equion or Conduent or Optum. The plan administrator um, is gonna be defined in the plan language um, as well as the address to contact them. If you don't have the plan language in hand yet, obviously your clients don't walk in and give you all the documents you need on day one. The plan language, the employer, excuse me, the plan administrator is going to be the employer. The only time the plan administrator is not the employer is if the plan administrator designates a third party to be that um, plan administrator. And the only time you see that is in union situations. And that's because several union shops will get together, buy one what they call multi-employer plan, and then designate usually the trust as the plan administrator. So most of the time, if you can send this 29 um, USC 1024B4 document request off to the employer, um, you, the, the place firm plan administrator, um, and that will trigger the statute. What I bring up um, about the plan administrator is really key. This is from Anthem's language of 2018 in their boilerplate. They point out very clearly, the plan administrator is not the claims administrator. The plan sponsor is not the claims administrator. The plan administrator is a distinct party. That is who needs to get the letter. Nobody else. Nothing else triggers the statute. You see so many times where the attorney will send this letter off to Rawlings or HRI or, and think that's going to trigger it. It doesn't. It's got to go to the plan administrator. I don't even courtesy copy the recovery vendor. Um, if they want the information, they can go to their client. Um, that's just I'm a little passionate about fighting those guys. Um, the only other steps in this deal of the statute is it has to be upon written request of the plan participant or beneficiary. It does not need to be sent certified or registered mail, just written request sent to the plan administrator. Now, it says signed by the or by the request of the participant or beneficiary. Um, I see a lot of these letters being sent out under the signature of the trial attorney. I've sent them out for years myself under my own signature, not the signature of the participant or beneficiary. That is a very low risk problem, um, but the statute does say specifically from the beneficiary. So even though it's not a big issue, um, I think it is the best practice to have your, the, the beneficiary sign that request. Of course, you can sign it yourself and it's not gonna be a problem, except it, it could be on those very um, tangential issue kind of cases. Um, so I say avoid all that, just have your client sign it, send it out, it's a template letter. Um, I'll show you a copy of what mine, mine ha I have for mine and I know Greg is happy to supply that upon request. Um, but I recommend having the client sign it just to you know, avoid any issue. And what are you entitled to get? Everything. Um, the latest SPD. And I like the last part of the statute. Other instruments under which the plan is established or operated. That is a catch-all. That is everything. So you want every document. Um, and I bring this up because there's two reasons there's document request. One, is you need to see the plan language to evaluate the strength of the plan's recovery rights. But no less important is being a thorn in their side. The recovery industry, and it's now a huge industry, it used to be healthcare recovery, now Equion and Rawlings, and now everybody else is out there. Optum and Conduit used to be clients of mine. Optum, it used to be the internal unit, subrogation unit for United Healthcare. They now have external clients. Conduit was, well, was, was built by Xerox. Um, former client of mine, because there's so much money to be made and it's all done on a volume-based situation. When I was on the other side, I had a file load of 550 cases. We call it a backlog of $50 million. I mean, those cases are worth $50 million in subrogation. I had an $800,000 a month goal. Yeah, I had to bring in $800,000 a month just to make my goal. Never had a problem making it. 
They just throw the money at you. So what I say of being a thorn in their side is don't just pay them. Make them work for it. Think about how hard you work to get that settlement or that award. Don't just hand over a big chunk of it to someone on the phone who talked to you for 10 minutes and sent you three letters. Make them prove their case. This document request is cumbersome to comply with. They don't like complying with it. And this is how it generally works. The document request goes to the plan administrator. That plan administrator calls their insurance broker or their TPA, Cigna. Cigna then calls Rollins and says, what the heck are you guys doing? We hired you to take care of this, and now our client is getting threatening letters from Dave Place. Settle this. You've now created some leverage for you to get a better deal. Why that is so important is because we're always David versus Goliath. The ERISA plans have all the law on their side. Um, I'm sure you guys are used to dealing with that. Um, but it's the same here. So you need to be clever. And the, the, the downfall of Goliath is he doesn't have to be clever. They're used to walking around 800 pound gorilla and smashing individual trial attorneys at a time. These are ways to push back. A great example is the administrative service agreement. That is the contract between the employer group, the TPA, and then a separate one between the TPA and the recovery vendor. You're entitled to get those. They don't want to give them to you because there's um, protected business information inside there. For instance, Rawlings authority level or the fees that Rawlings charges. Obviously, Rawlings doesn't want to opt them to see that, so they protect that. But what you've done is you've created a situation where the plan administrator is now subject to penalties because their own vendor, Rawlings, will not give them the document they need to comply with your statutory request. You've, again, you've created leverage. The situation they're used to dealing with is, I have 600 files on my desk. I have a trial attorney who doesn't want to pay me. I'm just going to keep threatening him. That's what they're dealing with. So anytime you can elevate the conversation, talking about the law, the facts, or the equity, or the logistics of the, of the case, that's going to benefit your client. But what are you entitled to get? This is a good bullet point of all the documents you're entitled to get that I request in my um, 1024B4 request. It's broad, but it is backed up by the statute. Complying with all that is difficult for them. And again, that's going to inure to your client's benefit. What I always say to the recovery vendors is, if you're going to demand 100% um, repayment, we're going to demand 100% compliance. We're going to hold all the money in trust to have every document you're required to give us. Again, they have an $800,000 a month goal. They are not happy to wait forever. They're, delay works in your client's benefit. And the penalties, if they don't give you these documents within 30 days, they come subject to penalties of up to $110 a day. Now, you can see the statute says $100 a day. The CFR brings up to 110. That's important because when I was on the other side, I would get letters from attorneys who I could tell they'd been to a CLE because they'd threatened me a $100 a day penalty. I knew they didn't know what they were talking about. So make sure you reference the $110 a day penalty. That gives you a bit more credibility when you're arguing with the Optum and the Rawlings of the world, um, and they understand you're really going to bring the hammer, um, so they better deal with you. And these cases here on this slide are just a smattering of cases nationwide. There's one coming out almost every month where penalties are being assessed. Now, it's important to remember, you really don't want these penalties. <laughs> you only get these penalties if, you're, if you sue the ERISA plan or if you counterclaim when your client is sued. Neither one is a great option for your client um, who's been waiting for their personal injury case to settle for a few years. But what it gives you is a lot of leverage. So you can go back to the ERISA plan. It's about $10,000 every three months if they don't answer. So you go back to the ERISA plan and say, listen, I know you have a $100,000 lien. We think you have $30,000 in penalty. Let's start our discussion at $70,000. That's a great way to go about it. Um, it gives them something to say. Because the other reality is the person at Rawlings on the other end of the phone, they want your money. They don't want 100%. They want you to pay them something. They have a goal to make. So if you can give them some ammunition to go back to their client and say, this is why we should take this reasonable deal or agree to a waiver. Um, again, you're, you're, you're helping them do their job, which is going to be the benefit to your client. All right, that's a little bit of rest of 101, you know, what, particularly about the statute. Because um, that really, and I stress, that really is a step you need to make sure you're doing in your cases. 
um, to send that off. It's a, it's, it's a form letter. I mean, it's, it's a regular stamp. It's not registered mail. And it really will bring a lot of benefit to you down the road. Now, what do you get back? The IRS form 5500. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this form. I hate this form. I recommend not even looking at it. I think it's terrible. <laughs> the General Accounting Office wrote a letter to the IRS a couple years back saying, get rid of this form. It is so full of errors that there are over $20 billion in pension assets in the country unaccounted for. But it's the form that you always get. They love sending it out. Um, it reminds me a little bit of a Rodney Dangerfield movie when he went back to college with his son and he held a paper in his hands. It feels like a B, add some, add some pages to it, I need an A. I think that's what Rollins is doing. They're sending these out to you so you feel like you're getting something. You're not. This is just an IRS reporting form. This is not established the funding. It reports the funding. And those of you who look at this will, will say, Dave, when I get these, sections 9A and 9B, which report the funding, often all the boxes are checked. What does that mean? What it means is there is one IRS reporting form that a company reports on for all the benefits they provide. Health insurance, disability, life insurance, um, vision, dental, they all could be funded a different way, so they're all checked. So unless you get into the schedules and know how to read those and get down to premiums versus payments, which is really complicated, um, you don't have an idea how the plan is funded. I think it's a red herring. What you need is the plan language. That establishes the funding. That's what they're required to give you under the statute, and nothing else controls. The 5500 is nothing. It's like sending you a W-2. Thank you, but no. Send me the plan language. And don't accept plan language 2014. You should be getting plan language 2019 at the oldest, pretty soon 2020. Okay, why am I so hot on this? Because back when I was on the other side, everybody treated the SPD, the summary plan description, like it was a rider on insurance. We changed that, it changed the underlying rights. When I was at um, you know, it's Gibson and Sharks, the, um, we sold SPDs, it was part of what we did. A case came out in 2011 called Cigna versus Amar, which really changed things. And it said, only the master plan document controls. The summary plan document is not controlled. And that's important because what you're getting in the mail is a summary plan description. You're not getting the master plan. You need to get the master plan. Why? Often it will just mirror the summary plan, that is correct. But I would say at least 20 or 30% of the time, which is a significant percentage of the time, the master plan is significantly different. The reason being, like I said, no one was changing those for decades. So I got a Coca-Cola master plan document they alleged was their most recent one from 1998. I loved it because it, was, it didn't comply with any of the current law. No one was changing those. So you have a chance that the master plan document has more favorable language to your client. It might allow an automatic reduction for fees. It might say it doesn't take money from UIM coverage. Make sure you get that language and read it. Um, that, that really is key. And another main reason you do that document request, besides just being uh, difficult, which is fun in itself. Words matter. The key to ERISA is that whatever they put in the plan language, they were allowed to enforce. But if it's not in the plan language, they can't do it. Um, one of the key areas here is reaffirmation agreements. You see a lot of these where the plan will send a letter to your client saying, sign here agreeing to, you know, um, our, our acknowledging our subrogation reimbursement rights or not going to pay your bills. If the plan says they can do that, they can do that. The plan doesn't mention it, they can't. It's that simple. Um, this is important for kind of the first year law school reasons. It really is important just to read the language. I had a case in, in Michigan. Their language was only subrogation, not reimbursement. They didn't join the lawsuit, so the case is settled. They had no rights. They tried to fight for a while, but the language matters. Um, so make sure you pick it apart like you're a first-year law student. Okay. The most important part about ERISA, funding status. 
Why I say this is because I, the first question I get a lot is, Dave, how do I know if my client's on an ERISA plan? If your client receives their insurance through their employer, they're on an ERISA plan, period. Exceptions are, they, it's a federal government plan, they're a federal employee like a postal worker, um, they're gonna be on a FEBA plan. To work for a state agency like a sheriff's officer or county clerk, they're gonna be on a non-ERISA plan. Same thing for a church. They work for a church or a church hospital or a church school, they're gonna be on a non-ERISA plan. But those are very limited circumstances. The real distinction is the funding of the plan. Is it self-funded or is it fully insured? And I found a little uh, picture in the bottom of this slide. I thought it really told the story. This is why um, these plans are becoming self-funded. Look at the note from the Kaiser's Foundation, why you should be a self-funded ERISA plan. It makes you exempt from state insurance laws, including reserve requirements, mandated benefits, premium taxes, and consumer protection regulations. Wow, they're looking out for you there, Kaiser. <laughs> I mean, really, that's the reason? Just to, just to avoid all that? And the cost, the cost to the employer is significantly less. That's why you see so many self-funded plans. 63% of all health plans in the country are, have some self-funded component. And if the employer has more than 5,000 employees, 95% of them are self-funded. It's just a huge cost savings. That's what's happening. And they get to avoid all kinds of regulations. So the funding really is the key. And here's what I was talking about the exceptions. I'll go over this kind of quickly. Again, the government and church plans are not included in that. It makes it pretty simple. You can't work for the, uh, a state and then have the state uh, then exempt the, for yourself from the state's own laws. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. And church plans are exempted as well. That's in, the church plans one is, is a little bit sneaky in that church hospitals and church schools are included. Um, and often you'll get letters from a Rawlings or Optum saying St. Agnes's church um, has a self-funded plan and they, they want to be your payment. Well, it's St. Agnes' Hospital. And that may be true, but if you go on the, you know, the simple way it goes, go on the website of St. Agnes' Hospital. It'll say founded in 1783 to further the purpose of Jesus Christ on earth. That sounds like a church, not like a private hospital. And if so, then it's not, not, not an ERISA plan, even if it's self-funded. So make sure you check for that in particular with church hospitals and church schools. Where do you find this information out, Dave? How do I know? In the plan language, there's a page called the administrative page. Now, it can be anywhere in the plan document, first page, last page, in the middle, because these are simple contracts written by a thousand different law firms, not approved by an insurance commissioner. That's why they'd be quite different. But all of them are supposed to have this administrative page. And right here on it, it'll break it down and tell you how the plan is funded, who the employer, who the plan administrator is, the address, all of that information. And right here it says self-insured. That's a, it's very easy to do that. So I say, don't be um, terrified of these ERISA plans. Just look through them. Now, how do you get them resolved? Dave, you talked about ERISA. You told us how tough it is. You told us how to send these letters out. But I got cases on my desk I need settled. What the heck can I do? They won't budge. The optim person won't budge. $11,000 lien, I got $200,000 settlement. I can just pay it and move on. Don't. Fight for them. And I, I say it this way. Um, I don't know about you, but I still shop at Walmart. And I walk around at Walmart, three or $400 in my pocket matters. To your client, that matters. We're usually dealing with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollar numbers. But the average person, if they had a $500 check in the mailbox today, would be awfully happy about it. So a few hundred bucks, a few thousand bucks really matters to your injured, injured victim. And frankly, that's why I'm on this side. I really couldn't do it anymore. I actually couldn't look in the mirror anymore when I was on the other side. So I had to change. So I'm kind of dyed in the, um, in the wool on fighting for your clients here. But how to go about it? How do you do that? Again, the law really is all on their side. And the recovery vendor, um, your client is just a number to them. So where do you go about it? Well, they're not going to be attorneys. Um, they're going to know the law better than you do. They have, they're in a three or four page outline of the law in each state, and each circuit. But they have very large file loads. They're motivated to settle. A um, couple of the things, personal animosity, don't pick a fight with them. I know they can be jerks. I was a jerk. Don't pick a fight. Um, because it's just as easy for them to send a case out to local counsel as it is to settle it. In fact, it made me look like a bulldog if I was sending the case out to local counsel 
rather than like I was rolling over, I was asking for a compromise. So try to avoid the personal animosity. Um, and they just want the numbers. They really just want the numbers, settlement costs, fees, out of pockets. Um, other things you can do that legally don't matter, but are helpful, lump sum versus structure, apportioning the damages. Now, almost all plan language is gonna say, they don't care how the damages are allocated. Um, but again, you're raising the fruit up the tree, you're giving yourself something to talk about other than I just don't wanna pay you. So anything you can incorporate in your settlement, mediation notes, correspondence with defense counsel, um, that's all very helpful. Because remember, the person you're talking to at Rawlings has a lot of files, they wanna get settled. You, want to, you really wanna to try to co-opt them if you can to make them fight for your reasonable reduction or your waiver. Again, that's a, that's a Pollyanna point of view, I, I guess, but that would be the best case scenario. Audit and dispute, this applies to every lien. Go through the bills, make sure they are related, make sure there aren't duplicates. Um, it's much easier for the Rawlings person to take a bill right off than do a compromise. So if you can give them some reasons to take a bill off or being pre-existing or the surgery um, took longer than it should have, but you can't break the surgery in half because the bill is what it is, you can horse trade with them. Say the $20,000 surgery really should have been $10,000 because he needed it anyway. So get them to, to work on those kind of issues. The one thing you don't want to do is burn the candle at both ends. You don't want to claim everything to defense then turn around and tell the um, recovery vendor none of it's related. You can kind of split the baby with that. We're saying we claimed all this, but we didn't recover for that. Like you claimed the broken arm and the broken leg, but you only got let money on the broken leg. If you are able to do that, make sure you have good evidence to back that up. Because that is, they hear that every single, about 50 times a day. I mean, it is like the most common comment is that, oh, I didn't, you know, that didn't relate. We, we didn't claim that. Or we didn't get paid for that. Defense said it wasn't related. <laughs> of course, defense said it wasn't related. Um, so make sure you have some good evidence on that and, and aren't expecting that to really carry much weight. Um, my last slide on ERISA is sort of a new one, personal liability. Um, that was really a tenuous argument, a case called, um, about six circuit years ago. Um, but really what's, what's happened this case out of um, Florida this year, um, it's really set up that the portion of the settlement that is your fee is potentially subject to repayment to the ERISA plan, similar to the client's recovery. Um, I, I remember reading this case. It talks about the obligations upon the attorney, but the idea really is, is that it's not a general debt you would owe to the ERISA plan. Like your client does not owe a general debt to the ERISA plan. The, the full amount they could ever owe is the amount of the settlement, nothing beyond that. And under Montanel, um, if your client spends all the money, then the ERISA plan cannot assert a claim against them because the, the, the piece of property which they had a claim against, the settlement funds, have been destroyed. The same thing for your fee. However, if you take your fee and put it into your general accounts, all you've done is commingle it. So they then can go after you. If you take the funds, your particular fee on that particular case and put a particular um, an account and then spend it so it's all gone on non-traceable assets, then your liability is also extinguished. But as you can see, it's quite a few steps involved to do that. Um, I always recommend being proactive in dealing with liens. Because no one likes them, they tend to get, the can tends to get kicked a little bit on these and how can we avoid it? How can we slip through the cracks? I don't think that's a good option. Uh, I think it will come back to bite you. And I really recommend just, just dealing with them. Um, they, they, they trade on fear rather than reality. And there's a lot of ways to fight back on these guys. That's the end of ERISA. Greg, any questions on ERISA? I'm happy to jump into Medicare. Um, <clears throat> yeah, why don't, we, why don't we go ahead and get into Medicare? Um, and then at the end, I can see what okay. questions we've got. Maybe we'll do that. That sounds good. Um, and my two big topics are ERISA and Medicare, because that's where most of the questions come from. So we're dealing with Medicare next. Um, everybody, even more exciting topic than ERISA. What's going on with Medicare? Well, the Department of Justice has taken a very aggressive stance in the past 18 months. This is from a, um, a case in Philadelphia. There have been two cases out of Baltimore um, end of last year 
where the Department of Justice went directly after the attorneys for failing to repay Medicare. Now, with the cases are, are very different about how they, they went about not complying um, with paying Medicare. One thought didn't have to, uh, one firm didn't have never dealt with Medicare, one had a particular case they didn't deal with Medicare on. The settlements all worked out to about the same. There were penalties being um, assessed against the firms, but the real, the real result was each firm had to set up in their office a way to deal with Medicare, which was simply notify Medicare when a third party liability approached, tell Medicare when a case is settled and repay Medicare the final demand. I'm sure you guys are all doing that now. Make sure you are, because as you can see, the Department of Justice is really getting aggressive on this. Essentially, Medicare is out of money. They're looking for whatever they can. Um, so dealing with Medicare, make sure you have somebody in your office who's doing it. Make sure you stay on top of it. If you're not using the Medicare portal, I will slide that a little bit. Make sure you use the Medicare portal. It's an incredibly convenient tool. The only nice thing I'll ever say about Medicare is their portal. <laughs> Everything else Medicare is terrible, uh, but the portal is actually pretty helpful. Okay. Um, I've, I've skipped over a lot of the logistics I had to do with Medicare. I'm sure your office has those processes in place. So I want to focus on a couple areas that you may not know where some savings can be found. Um, hospital acquired conditions and bundled charges. And here's some other pointers on this slide, like don't use a highlighter if you're faxing to Medicare because they scan everything um, and make sure you use a correspondence cover sheet if you're faxing anything. But what I focus on is these two real um, kind of techniques. One is the hospital acquired condition. As you can see, there's a list of ICD-10 codes that Medicare should not have paid for. Deep vein thrombosis, surgical site infection. These are things that are, if they appear on your claim summary from Medicare, you need to dispute them and say, Medicare, you should not have paid for this. Go back to the provider, get your refund, take it off my client's claim summary. That has been an incredibly effective tool for us. Make sure you're doing that. Now, as you can see, the list is pretty specific. You know, we're lawyers, we extrapolate. Um, surgical site infection looks, sounds a lot like X, Y, or Z. Medicare, take that off also. Now, they may or may not agree with your extrapolation, but it's certainly worth making that argument. You want, if your client got an illness during their treatment and Medicare said they shouldn't pay for it, well, your client shouldn't pay for it either. Make sure you're checking that. Um, again, and when you dispute with Medicare, unless you're in the, the, the sped up process, you can dispute an unlimited number of times. So this costs you nothing to try and raise this. And it's a huge benefit to your client. Um, we've been over 80% successful in getting this done. The other really useful tool, um, which is incredibly unused because it's based upon a case out of California, is related to bundled charges. Now, I don't know, um, I'm sure some of you on the phone have dealt with these Medicare claim summaries, and some of you probably have not. As you can see in the slide, um, what happens is Medicare, they send a claim summary, and it'll show one payment made. But then under that will be a bundle of eight, 10, six ICD-10 codes, which comprise that particular bundled payment. Often, the bundled charges include an unrelated item in the bundle. Medicare won't take it off. Um, they said they can't unbundle it. That's exactly what they said in California. And the court said, okay, if you can't unbundle it, the statute says one item. Since you can't unbundle it, you can't get any of it. The whole bundle gets thrown out. The entire bundle gets thrown out, including the related care. That is huge. We had a lien go from $300,000 to $1,700 because of the unrelated care was bundled with related care. It is simply taking advantage of poor technology. Um, the law says they can't get paid for things unless the injured victim was later um, compensated by somebody else for that individual charge. That conflicts with the technical problems they have inside Medicare, so the whole bundle gets thrown out. 
I encourage you to do that on every single case where you see an unrelated charge bundled. Again, this is on Medicare's claim. This does not in any way impact your ability to claim the charge was, the, the injury was related because it was related. You're just talking about Medicare's technical problems in asserting a claim. So it really is a beautiful way to keep an enhanced damages number and a reduced demand to Medicare. The most useful tool on the portal, other than just having access, which is itself wonderful. Um, I'm sure a lot of you operate in a fog of what's going on with Medicare. The portal can have up-to-date access. But one of the really nice functions of the portal is the ability pre-mediation to, to give what's called a final conditional payment letter. This means you can get the Medicare's final conditional amount prior to mediation. So you can get this letter, looks just like this, printed off from Medicare saying, for the next three days, our final number is X. And, that's, and then from X, you still reduce by procurement costs. You still reduce fees and costs off that, which is easily calculable while you're sitting at the mediation table. So all these times where you sat there with your client wondering, you know, what am I going to net? You say, well, after I tell Medicare, we'll get the final demand and you can know. That's a thing of the past. But this has been true for almost four years now. And Medicare has done nothing to tell anybody about it. Um, this came out in January 2016. Um, it's, an, again, a really useful tool. How it works is like a rocket docket. If you think your case is going to settle in the next four months, on the portal, you click a little button, go into the sped up process. It does two things. It allows you to file one dispute only during this process, but Medicare must respond to dispute within 11 days or it's automatically granted. The other thing it does is allows for this letter to be downloaded. Now, assuming you download the letter today, mediation is kicked for two weeks, so you miss the deadline, or you download and the case doesn't settle. It in no way negatively impacted you with Medicare. You're just kicked out of the sped up process. I think it's very much like a rocket docket. You, there's no negative impact, just a big benefit if you can operate within those time um, frames. Repairing calculations, again, these are the CFRs, are very straightforward. The distinction is, though, whether or not the settlement amount is larger than Medicare's conditional payment amount. If it's equal to or greater than um, the Medicare payment amount, Medicare will take all the money. You get your fees and costs, Medicare takes all the rest. I see it happen all the time. There's no way around that. There's something called a pre-settlement compromise that I don't recommend. I recommend a post-settlement compromise. Um, but these are how the numbers work. So you can have this formula at your, day, at your mediation desk, along with their final conditional payment letter, work out the numbers with your client right there. One thing I'll stress though, I see this happen, especially in situations where Medicare is taking all the money, your attorney will just cut his fee. Don't do that. I mean, you can do that, but you've got to tell Medicare about it, which means the, the reduction is going to benefit Medicare, not your client. One way around that is to um, ask for a waiver or a compromise post-payment to Medicare. Um, that happens all the time. They're great. They're, um, we've gotten millions of dollars back from Medicare on that process. Um, the one, the, the, even if you're not successful, though, in getting a compromise through those various tools, post final demand now, Medicare's letter from you to you on the compromise may say, we've denied your compromise, but we now authorize you to reduce your fee and to benefit the, um, the injured victim. That gives you the ability to do what a lot of attorneys are doing right now without the problem of being considered Medicare fraud. Medicare Advantage plans are the other big issue that are confronting trial attorneys now. And I love this slide, like most attorneys and most people feel like that with Medicare, it's just confusing. Medicare Part C and Part D are considered Medicare Advantage plans. They are essentially Medicare now. They have all the same recovery rights, um, they have the penalties, they have everything. Um, so you're gonna wanna make sure you deal with Medicare Advantage plans. The problem is, it's hard to find them. Every um, beneficiary for Medicare, when they turn 65, gets a red, white, and blue card, even if they choose to use a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, I always use the example of my in-laws. 
My mother-in-law is on Medicare. My father-in-law is on Medicare Advantage. If you ask them who their insurance carrier is, they both say Medicare. The big red flag here is if you're dealing with, if you think your client's on Medicare and Medicare's conditional payment comes back at zero, that should be a red flag. Go back to your client, go through those bills and see who's making payments. Not my law firm nor anybody else can locate that Advantage plan. There are hundreds of them out there. You've got to get that information from your client or from those billing records. And then you're going to put them on notice and deal with them. The nice thing at Medicare Advantage plans is there's none of that circular bureaucracy of going paying Medicare, going for a compromise, asking for a waiver. You can negotiate right up front with them. They're tough to negotiate, but they, they will negotiate with you um, for all the same reasons Medicare will post final demand. Um, but they have the benefit of doing it ahead of time. You're dealing with Rollins or an Optum. Again, the exact same leverage points that apply on ERISA, goals, you know, high file counts, apply here as well. So negotiate with these. Don't just accept the statutory reduction. In fact, Rawlings often won't even give the statutory reduction. They say they're not, they don't have to. They do, they're full of it, fight for it, but fight for more than that. Attorney liability is a big issue here. Um, Humana in particular is targeting attorneys as a profit center because they know you have the funds and the amount you owe if you don't pay the Medicare Advantage plan back is double. That's right, double. Medicare could do that. They never do. They send the case off. Uh, they add interest. They send the case off the partner of treasury and they garnish social security benefits. They do not, other than the partner of justice, they have not gone after attorneys for double damages. The Medicare Advantage plans have, and they will. I was um, expert witness here in this um, Paris Blank case. Um, $400,000 was their demand against that law firm. A $200,000 payment, they wanted double. It did resolve, but I can tell you that your e &O coverage does not pay for punitive damages. So they'll pay the first part, the second part's gonna be on you. So make sure you're dealing with it. Federal Employees Health Benefits Act, FEBA. A blog I wrote this years ago was titled FEBA, what the hell is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the world's largest group of sponsored employer, um, employer sponsored plan in the world or 8 million employees. Um, the nice thing about FIBA is the link is right here. All FIBA plans are available online. It's Office of Personnel Management. So you see know which state your client's in, who their employer is, the poster worker, that kind of thing. Go to the website, you can read the plan language. The bad thing about FIBA plans is recently, in the past couple of years, They've won a big case which says FEMA plans do preempt state rights and the plan language is enforced as written. Unlike ERISA, which we've had 20 years to build up some federal common law, there is none of that with FEMA. It just says pay it and you got to pay it. There's no, there's no law that talks about how to shape that argument. The nice thing, though, about FEMA plans is often they'll include this language, almost always. Well, it takes a second to read it. I use that language to reduce for attorney's fees, but again, also to extrapolate. I'll say, I'll say clearly when this plan was written, they understood there would be times they would, it would be in the best interest of the plan and the plan member to seek a compromise. Yes, they specifically articulate attorney's fees, but obviously that, that's just a reference to the general principle of compromise. Um, that works pretty well. So I recommend using that. Because what you get from Rawlings is a letter saying, this is a FEMA plan, pay us. They don't bother to read the language. Point that particular language out to them. It really is one of the few places you can hang your hat with FEMA. Um, of course, there's always this the reality of logistics and you can't get blood out of, a, out of a stone if there's no money to pay back the plan. The last topic I'm we'll talking about today before we get to your questions is Medicaid. And I'll very shortly talk about that because each state is quite a bit different. And I know we have a nationwide audience. The one thing that is not different nationwide is Alborns and WAS. Um, this was up in the air a little bit um, when some of the, the underlying textual statute was gonna be changed. It did not get changed, it was fixed. So these cases are still the law of the land. In short, Medicaid can only seek repayment from the portion of your recovery that is for past 
medical bills, not pain and suffering, not lost wages, not lost enjoyment of life, all those other elements. North Carolina had set up a situation, Florida has one like it too, where they had a statutory scheme where they got, in order to deal with um, Alborn, they said, we'll just take one third of everything. The court said that's not appropriate. You have to do an actual investigation. So you're going to want to build your case from the start showing where these damages come from. And you're going to want to allocate as little as possible, if your client's on Medicaid, to medical bills, past medical bills. Um, again, it has to be done truthfully and based upon facts. You can't you just make it up um, because they will fight that. But if you carefully structure your case in good faith, this is a very good argument to make on, regarding repayment when you settle the case. That's really all I have prepared. I'm happy to answer your questions now. Great. Well, thank you, Dave. That was amazing to get that much information into uh, 45 minutes about uh, lien resolution on ERISA, FIBA, and Medicare is, is quite an accomplishment. So let me, yeah, we've got quite a few questions here. A lot of them are case specific, uh, but there are some that are more general in nature that I think will be more applicable to, to the group here. Um, let me just, one, I'm just going to group these into different categories. Regarding Medicare Advantage plans, um, you talked about the need to make sure that you take care of Medicare's conditional lien, of course. Is there a need, or do we need to, do, do attorneys need to think about protecting Medicare Advantage plans, future interests like you do with traditional Medicare? Is there such thing as a Medicare Advantage plan, MSA, in other words? Sure, great question. I hear that question quite a bit. And, and I'm, not a, I'm not an MSA guy, but I know enough to get me in trouble. Yeah. Um, and I've actually, I've actually written and researched on this topic quite a bit. Okay. Um, the re reason a Medicare, what a Medicare set is, first of all, a Medicare set aside is never required. There's, there's no requirement in the statute for it. What Medicare says is you're required to protect Medicare's future interest and the preferred method is an MSA. <laughs> Thank you, Medicare, for being clear. Um, but the reason MSA is required in traditional Medicare is because you're protecting the Medicare trust. In a Medicare Advantage plan, the funds are not coming out of Medicare trust. They're coming out of a private industry. So no, no MSA is required. There okay. is a, a tangent argument that, and it's not in place now, that down the road they may try to do that because some of the, 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 the Medicare, Social, Medicare Advantage plans base their premiums on risk pooling, which may in some way affect the Medicare trust. But that's a big bank shot that is not in, applies right now. So essentially, you do not need to worry about MSA for a Medicare Advantage plan. Okay. And down the road, that might be a, a, an issue if Humanus one pushes it. All right. So that may be a benefit to a client that's on a Medicare Advantage plan is you don't necessarily need to worry about that like you do in a traditional Medicare situation. Um, also, right. in, see, in, my, my father-in-law settled his workers' compensation case, and he has an MSA. He gets a check once a year and spends it. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I know there's no there's no rule to have professional management of an MSA. So I think that's what most people probably do is spend it. Um, is there any, there are double damages, of course, if you don't con consider the Medicare's conditional lien. Are there damages to, or is, do, do the attorneys have liability if they don't consider Medicare's future interests? Or what is the worst case scenario if you, if a client decides they don't want to do anything, set up an MSA, in the future for Medicare's interest? Do they, does the attorney have liability or is it just the client that may lose potential Medicare coverage for their injury related care? Sure, you're not gonna have liability to Medicare. What's gonna happen is your client shows up um, at the hospital with a doctor for care, Medicare denies coverage. Say mm -hmm. that's, related, that's related to an accident you made recovery on three years ago. Your client's gonna drive home from that doctor's office, pick up the phone and call one person, right. yell at that person. So your exposure is gonna be to your client who's gonna say, you never told me this is going to violate or, or you know jeopardize a Medicare coverage. I'm suing you for malpractice. Right. So you're going to want to paper your file for sure if your clients have Medicare, just to say we discussed this and we decided not to have one. Um, some MSA companies out there sell what call a, a no MSA letter. Generally, it's around 500 bucks for that letter. They'll do an evaluation of your case. If you don't need one, um, they'll send you, sell you that letter. Um, I, I think it's a for you, the, the risk is your client uh, coming back at you. So um, right. I, I think you're going to want to you know, dot that I for yourself. Okay. So really they need to educate their client on the worst case scenario 
and have their client either want to set something up or acknowledge that, Hey, I was educated and I decided I didn't want to do one. Exactly right. Okay. Um, Back to the Medicare's conditional payments. Um, Is there anything that can be done in a Medicaid waiver or Medicare waiver situation um, that short of a hardship kind of waiver? In other words, if I've got a case and I want to reduce it more than the, the statutory amount for fees and costs, if, if my client's not necessarily in a hardship situation, is there anything that can be done in a Medicare lien situation? Sure, that's a great question. Um, there are actually three ways post-final demand to get a refund back from Medicare. I'm talking about refund because the idea is you pay the final demand to, to within the 60 days and you ask for the money back saying we paid too much. One is the hardship you talked about, and that's, but that's based upon your client's total financial circumstance. We had a case in Florida where the injury victim netted $2 million after attorney's fees. She paid Medicare $160,000. She got all of her money back because she was 83, and I'll save the war story, but she became responsible for grandchildren. And Medicare saw that was a very expensive need, and even if she had all this money, they refunded it to her. So it's not just your client needs a small settlement to get a waiver. They could get a really good settlement. It depends on their financial need. This lady was in Section 8 housing and already on social services. Um, but those factors matter. That's the hardship waiver. That is based upon financial circumstance. Okay. Then, then there's a compromise request, which is just a general question. You know, the issues are Medicare doesn't make sense to pay this back to you in this amount, and you make an offer to Medicare. They will counter or they'll accept your offer. Okay. And the last waiver is just called the general, uh, for the best interest of the program. That is just Medicare. The secretary of uh, HHS has the authority to waive or compromise any claim he or she thinks is appropriate. So it can be a lot of reasons. Um, I have had them waive because Medicare blew the statute of limitations. I have one right now that blew the statute of limitations. Um, mm-hmm. or, or the facts just don't make sense. So it, it's, it, and now in the portal, you can request waivers on the portal. Again, it's a click of a button. It's certainly worth your time, even if you think the chances are low. Okay. No, that's great. So don't necessarily give up if, if, you, if you don't get more than that on the first time, which you generally don't. I mean, they'll only give you fees and costs up front unless you right. ask for a waiver afterwards, right? Right. Exactly right. Okay. All right. And I got this question asked in several different ways, but basically the question is this, what if I don't necessarily want to deal with all of this stuff? How do I how do I outsource this to you? How do you get paid? How does that work? Sure. Um, and then are there any ethical considerations in outsourcing lean resolution? Sure. Great question. I, I'll answer them in reverse. Um, very few states have any kind of ethical rule at all on lean resolution. Ohio, New York, um, and Virginia um, all encourage it. Um, and they all have, um, very similar rules. The rest of the states follow the ABA model rule on outsourcing. And it follows very, very clearly on this. Um, make, make, make sure you maintain confidentiality of the client. Make sure the fees are reasonable. Um, make sure that there'll be oversight by an attorney. I am an attorney. Um, and, and the client has to sign a separate written informed consent. So that's why all my intake packages have that. So even if your client, a lot of our turn, a lot of our clients will input in the retainer agreement that they may hire a firm like mine to handle the lien, mm-hmm. they will still need to sign a separate written informed consent. Okay. Uh, that, that spells out our fees. And my fees are pretty straightforward. Um, my fees 10% of any savings I obtain. So in a situation like a Medicare Advantage plan, it's only after the statutory reduction that I start counting my savings. Or if an ERISA lien, say you negotiated yourself and you got some off, but you want to do better, send it to me. It's 10% of what I say. And it's capped so that I never take more than 10% of your client's walk away. I say walk away, I mean after fees, after cost, and after paying any lien we worked on. As you guys know, there's a lot of situations where there's $200,000 in medical bills and you got a $25,000 policy. Um, that's for the situation where my, my fee cap really comes into play. Um, yeah, I'm on this side because I want to help the injury victim. I made, you know, I spent a lifetime making money off the injury victim. So yeah. even if cases, I, I stress it to Greg all the time too. If you have a case that doesn't make sense to outsource to me, or um, shoot an email to me, the question or to Greg, 
I'm more than happy to spend some time, give us some free advice, some free tactics, some look here, do that. I really want your clients to get as much money as possible. I mean, they, they're the ones who need it, not, not Optum or Conduit. Yeah, absolutely. And I can attest to that. I, I know that many of the attorneys that we work with have spent time with you on the phone that you've just been willing to share tips and tricks with them and not sent them a bill at all. So absolutely, that's that's been valuable to the, the attorneys we work with. So, and what you said there is interesting. So even if an attorney or someone in their office wants to do their best with an ERISA lien, for example, and then hires you to see if you can do better, you're okay with that scenario too. Absolutely. In fact, there are a lot of, um, a lot of paralegals who feel very good about their negotiation skills and they should, they do a lot of, they do a lot of good negotiating. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but, and they'll, and they'll, they say, I got 30% off in this day. Can you do better? And one thing I'll do first is I'll tell you not whether I think I can, right. If I think you did a really good job, I'll say, yes. Or I'll say, I can get, save another thousand bucks. It'll take me a year. It's not worth it. Um, I'll give you my honest opinion. Um, but I, I, I generally, I, I can do a better job. Um, nothing against your firm or get your paralegals or associates working on those, but this is, I'm just focused on this. You know, I would say a paralegal is dealing with Medicare. She can be doing so much more with her time than sitting on the phone waiting for Medicare to pick up the phone call. Um, that, that's like the real benefit to getting lien resolution outsourced is a, a personal injury case, a medical malpractice case, a products case. Those are complicated issues um, to deal with. This is a whole nother complicated issue. You don't need to be um, yeah. adding to your plate. Yeah, absolutely. And where you're taking 10% of what you save, I guess the attorney has to think, is Dave going to do 10% better than my paralegal, right? right. To On this lien. And if so, then I don't have to waste my paralegal's time doing what a professional can do. So right. to me, it seems like a no brainer. The other thing, like you mentioned before, happy clients are happy. If you can come back to them, say, look, we were able to reduce this lien by X amount. I know that in, our, in, in my own practice, there's been several attorneys that have been heroes in the eyes of their clients because they've hired you and then they can go back to their clients and say, Hey, look what we did, you know? Right, um, right. And so that's, that's a great way to get client loyalty and get them talking about you. Um, one, one last thing I want to point out, Greg, about my, my feet. Um, Medicare, Medicare is because I, th I tend to think of everything as two different services. Marissa, FIBA, Medicare Advantage, disability, all these are done on that percentage of savings because it's all negotiation. Regular Medicare, Medicare um, conditional payments. I do that service for a flat fee of 500 bucks. And that okay. is for me, me reporting the case to Medicare, um, doing all the auditing, doing all the disputing, handling, um, getting a, the, the letters for mediation, getting the final demand for you. All that for $500. Um, and okay. then after, if you, need, if you need a waiver compromise after that, we, we'll deal the 10% fee. But okay. the real benefit of that, again, we were talking about the productivity. Um, you know, Medicare is, everybody hates Medicare. And yeah. it really sucks a lot of your time up. So that's why I put a flat fee there because it truly is an administrative process, mm -hmm. um, not really a negotiation process for that. Yeah. Okay, I didn't actually know that. So that's great. Now for 500 bucks to take the total, the contingent, the conditional Medicare lien at totally out of the office. That's a, that's a big deal. All right. Um, and then just to address a few housekeeping questions that we got. Um, yes, we will send, Dave, are you willing to send these slides out um, to those Absolutely. that ask for it? Okay. Again, if you're watching this live or if you watch it on, um, on tape, when we send it out to our list, if you, if you want a copy of these slides, send an email to lean at amicusplanners.com lean at amicusplanners.com and we'll respond with um, a copy of, of Dave's slides, which I think are super helpful. Um, also that template letter, that ERISA template letter that you mentioned, Dave. Um, I'll make are you sure okay? include that as well. Okay. You're okay if we send that out as well? Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think some of these other questions are too case specific to take time up right now on, but Send, send emails, questions to lean at Amicus Planners. We'll respond to those. Dave will respond to those. And we can, you know, hopefully help your practice, help you be more productive, help you to re reduce those liens more efficiently and effectively than maybe you're doing right now. And Dave, just want to thank you for your time and expertise, um, being willing to share this with our, our Facebook group and our, and our attorney list. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, let us know. But sure, appreciate your time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. All right. And with that, we will sign off and uh, till next time, stay tuned to the, the Facebook page. And we'll let you know of other topics that we might do a, a webinar on. Um, a lot of you have asked about attorney fee deferrals and 
um, other topics. So we'll be keep 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 looking at the page, and we'll continue to try to add valuable content as we see fit. So take care. See ya.